And so with no further, here's Dr. Daryl Ray. You know, we've been uh, setting quite a bit here, so uh, I, I think it might be a good idea for us to uh, stand up and stretch our legs. And uh, in the meantime, as we're doing that, I will say a prayer for us all here. <laughs> so if, if I could get your attention, yeah, stand up, stretch a little bit. And uh, this, this will consecrate this meeting beyond anything you've ever imagined. Dear Flying Spaghetti Monster, <laughs> for giving us sex and sexuality, whether homo or heterosexual, bi or trans, and for not making us like those uptight Christians, Muslims, Muslims, Mormons, and Baptists. We thank you for wonderful masturbatory fantasies and for their pornography on which they're often based. FSM, we ask that you grant us sex partners, lovers, wives, and husbands that know where our G-spots, our clitoris, and the sweet spot on our penis is. Grant us long, loving foreplay with deep, wet kisses, followed by huge orgasms and loving cuddles after. Grant us the courage and wisdom to communicate openly and honestly with our partners and give them more pleasure than we receive, for we know it is far better to give than to receive. Your noodliness. We do not need 72 virgins. In fact, we ask that you send no virgins, for we don't want to have to train them. Unless, of course, they are very willing to be trained. We especially plead today that you not send any repressed Christian virgins, males or females, for they'll only do, feel guilty and cause great problems with their abstinence-only training. Your posthumous. We ask that you give us the wisdom to understand and appreciate our partner's kinks or lack thereof. Whether foot worship or spanking, ropes or talking dirty, help us to appreciate the, uh, the full sexuality and lead us not into temptation of judgment and scorn for others when their sexual preferences are not ours. We do ask in the name of Roman for retribution, shame, and scorn on pedophile priests, hypocritical ministers sleeping with the choir director, and gay bashing closeted ministers. Oh, spaghetti -o. We ask that you send condoms and birth control in abundance and your blessings on the many dedicated workers at the Trojan Condom Factory in Planned Parenthood. In the name of Dan Savage and Greta Christina, we pray, for they are the true gods and goddesses of this world. Robin. Thank you. You will never hear a prayer like that in a Christian church of any kind. <laughs> I'm calling this talk, The Shame of Believing, or Why Do We Act Like Christians? I put a little warning up here at Blair Scott's uh, request. There is nudity involved in this presentation. If it makes you uncomfortable, then uh, go visit the coffee shop for a few minutes. All right, well. <laughs> this, this is the real artwork. It got edited later. I do have a question for this group, and this is a serious question, so get your serious hat on. Do you masturbate? I do! Okay, great. All right, now some of you have two hands up. <laughs> Those are the ambidextrous ones, I guess. All right. Imagine asking that question in a Catholic, a Baptist, a Mormon, or a Muslim mosque. Imagine it. It wouldn't happen, and nobody would raise their hand. The preacher certainly wouldn't be raising her hand. Religionists live a lie. They live shameful, they live out of shame. They're ashamed they had premarital sex. They're ashamed they, they masturbate. They're ashamed that they use porn, and they do use porn. They're ashamed that they've done sex acts that disgust themselves. And they're ashamed most of all, to tell their children the truth about sex and sexuality. They live a big lie. They lie to themselves and others about their own sexual behavior. They pretend they don't, they pretend not to do what we know they do, what everyone else does. 
They preach against the very behavior that they engage in. And they let their children, they lie to their children about their own behavior. Most, we know 95% of all people have premarital sex, except Catholic priests and Baptist ministers. Yeah, that's the 5%, right? So, so people are having premarital sex, but they're telling their children they did not have it. They're lying. Religionists have to live a lie in order to maintain the facade of their, of their religious ideology. How do we know this? Well, we know it because from our research and from other research, if you saw my sex and secularism talk online or you downloaded uh, our data at ipcpress.com, you can get the report for free. We know from our own data and other ma major national surveys that they engage in the same sexual activities as secularists. They start sex at the same time. They begin masturbating at the same time and they give their children false information about sex. The US, US research on abstinence only alone tells us almost all that. The evidence, the evidence is that religionists also have more sexually transmitted infections. They have higher levels of unwed uh, teen pregnancies than secularists do. We have lower teen, lower teen pregnancies and less disease. We use, we act, they use porn about as much as we use porn. Ex except in some states, like the most religious states in this nation, like Utah and Mississippi, are higher in porn use than other states. And it is higher six out of seven days. Any guesses on the day that it's not higher? <laughs> Sunday. But they catch up for, for the rest of the week. <laughs> Religionists actually get divorced more than secularists do. Even as they say, bring Jesus into your marriage and it will make your marriage happy. That is bullshit. It'll stop, it will stop the sex in your marriage. As I, I talk about in, uh, in my, my new book, Sex and God, many religionists lose, lose sex when they get married after not very many years afterwards. And religionists have more abortions. The highest abortion rates in the nation are in the states that are the most religious including Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, in these fundamentalist places because their kids aren't getting proper information. I call it the politics of shame. This man never masturbates. He, has, he never had sex outside of marriage. We know his wife did. He never uses birth control. His wife did have an abortion, but he doesn't allow anybody else to have one. And he wants everybody else to get his sexually transmitted infection called Catholicism. <laughs> or at least the way the Pope describes that. I mean, what he's telling us is that the United States should not allow women to have birth control. Should not allow women to have abortions. Should, not, uh, should shame women if they walk into a birth control center of any kind, whether it's Planned Parenthood or something else. Because of their shame, religionists cannot rationally evaluate their own behavior. And when you can't evaluate your behavior, then you cannot correct that behavior. Religionists are constantly in a negative feedback loop where their, uh, their behavior undermines the very thing they're trying to do. That's why they have more abortions. That's why they have more teen pregnancies and more diseases. They have difficulty channeling and controlling their own sexual urges. They experience self-loathing and fear of their own natural urges. And they experience depression largely because of that in many, many cases. They lie to their spouse and their children about sex. Many Christians, many religious spouses lie to their spouses about having had premarital sex. I know men and women who had multiple partners before they got married, but they, taught, they said they were virgin when they got married. So we, the whole marriage is based on a lie. And then they have to turn around and tell their children, don't have sex before marriage. Your father and I did not. Another lie. It's lie after lie after lie among most religionists. They express their sexual frustration uh, in anger, blaming and judging others, and especially in homophobia. I think, and this is my personal opinion, I think the roots of homophobia are, uh, for many people, are in the anxiety people have about their own masturbatory activities. 
and shame about their own bodies. When people are told from very young that masturbation is a sin, and they're going to do it anyway, every primate masturbates. I studied with the great psychotherapist uh, Albert Ellis back years ago. And, yeah, I love him. Great guy. He had a famous saying, 97% of men masturbate and the other 3% are lying. It's probably not quite as high for women, but we know women masturbate probably 80% or more. Now to prove my point, as a great example, this, this was a quote I got from just a few months ago from the megachurch pastor Mark Driscoll of Mars Hill Mega Church. Masturbation can be a form of homosexuality because it is a sex act that does not involve a woman. Aren't you glad the women get off here? That was a bad pun. If a, man were, if a man were to masturbate while engaged in other forms of sexual intimacy with his wife, then he would not be doing so in, such, in a homosexual way. However, any man who does so without his wife in the room is bordering on homosexual activity, particularly if he's watching himself in the mirror and being turned on by his own body. What the fuck? Idea. I'm thinking he's done that once or 17 times. Religious sexuality is, is unnatural. The way religions teach sexuality is absolutely unnatural. It's designed to make you feel guilty, and if you read my book, uh, the, the God Virus, you, you know the guilt is a key ingredient in the infection cycle. It is intended to create shame in you. But let's look at the facts. The facts are that humans have thousands, maybe 10,000 sex acts for every live birth, if especially if you include masturbation. Well, that proves right there that sex is not for procreation. We know that most mammals masturbate or have sex in some way, but most mammals have it only when the female is receptive. So for humans, for bonobo apes and probably for dolphins, sex is for fun and bonding. But the Pope would say, you should have sex like a dog. <laughs> When the pup tells you to have sex for reproduction only, he's telling you, you have to have sex like a dog, or an insect, or a, or a cow. I mean, almost all species on the planet only have sex for reproduction. We don't. Sex has evolutionarily taken on a new role for our species, and I'm happy about it. Uh, yeah. And, and just like Tim Nip mentioned, I love boobs too. So you put the two together. But our friend the Pope, the, the guy just doesn't know what he's telling us. He's telling us to act like animals. How many times have you heard religionists say, well, that's like an animal if you have sex outside of marriage, or if you have sex too many times, or if you masturbate, or you have premarital sex, any of those things, they say, well, that's like an animal. No, it's like a human. You are more human doing that than you are doing it like the Pope says. Shame, fear, and guilt are the foundation of religious sexual infection, and it is a sexually transmitted disease. As you know, I've written about this many places. Religion is only transmitted most effectively through sexual guilt, shame, and fear. It's always in religion's advantage to um, uh, instill irrational fear in people's uh, in, in, in fear of sex. It allows religion to install the guilt program and activate the guilt cycle. Without guilt, fear, shame, all the major religions would collapse. Now let me explain the guilt cycle here because it's critical to the understanding of why religion is so effective. The guilt cycle works like this. When you're young, you get taught what you should and shouldn't do by your mom or your dad. You like the cookies, your mom says, don't eat the cookies. You get a cookie out of the cookie jar before supper, she slaps her hand. Okay, that was yesterday. Today, she's not looking. And you think, wow, those cookies sure taste good. Mom's not looking. So you get the tension, you engage in the behavior. You stick your hand in the cookie jar and you eat a cookie. 
And then you feel the guilt. The guilt is cognitive dissonance. It's the feeling you get from violating mom's rule. Here's mom's rule, here's what I did, and the, the blank spot in between is where cognitive dissonance comes out. And we call that, in, in uh, lay language, we just call it guilt. Religion comes along and says, ah, but we can teach you what to be guilty of. Eating cookies is only one thing to be guilty of. You should be guilty of having premarital sex. You should be guilty of thinking bad thoughts, lustful thoughts about others, other people of any gender before you're married. And then only the person you're married to. You should be, you should be uh, shameful and guilty if you, have, uh, if you masturbate. So it teaches you all these things to do. And uh, then when you do them, where are you going to get forgiveness? How are you going to get rid of this intense guilt that comes from having been trained, having the guilt process put into you? So you've got to come back and get forgiveness. Have you ever heard of a Catholic going and getting um, uh, absolution or give, confessing to a Baptist minister? How about a Muslim confessing to a Catholic priest? Are there any Jews that, can, that confess to imams? No, you don't hear that, do you? Because people can only get forgiveness from the religion where they got the disease in the first place. It brings... And that's why... That's why I call it the guilt cycle. It brings you back to where you learned the guilt in the first place. It's the, the best con game ever invented. No psychologist could have done a better job. And it's been around for centuries. It's probably an evolutionary thing in the sense that religions have evolved. I'm not talking biological. I'm talking social evolution. I'm talking about uh, memes or memetics, if you will, from, from Dr. Dawkins. So the religion gives you the disease. Then it says, we can cure it by giving you more of the disease. Now come back to confession. Read your Bible. Go to Bible study. Ch attend church. Now here's a quote I want you to memorize. You can take religion out of sex, but you cannot take sex out of religion. What would happen if the Pope woke up one morning and said, Whoa, I had a great wet dream last night. I think we'll make masturbation legal. Or Ted Haggard woke up one morning and said, Man, that, that prostitute I was with in Denver sure was nice. I think we'll make homosexuality legal. It can't happen. What would happen to the Catholic Church if they allowed sexual behavior of almost any kind without some kind of sanctions? What would happen to the Baptists, the fundamentals, the evangelical, the Muslims, if they allowed homosexuality to be rampant and, and allowed homosexuals into their churches? So you're probably sitting here thinking, you know, Daryl, what are you talking about? I'm not religious. Some of you have never been religious. You were raised by atheist parents. How does it apply to me? Well, here's how it applies. You are swimming in a polluted pool. The culture around you is polluted. I guarantee I have never met a, even a lifelong atheist that hasn't in some way been polluted by this culture we're swimming in. Many, many atheists are still, in fact, even if you've been an atheist for years, you're still infected with the crazy ideas you heard when you were a kid. For example, you could have been an atheist, but you were in the 8th grade class, gym class, and boys were making fun of other boys who were caught masturbating. Oh, they're going to be homosexual because they are masturbating. That's a religious concept. And it's in the boys' locker room. And I don't care if you're an atheist or not. Eight-year-old boys who get made fun of by other boys are going to remember it. You are now infected. It is that easy to infect a child with the crazy ideas that religion has. So, my, one of my, uh, well, so, if you experience guilt or shame around your sexu sexuality, you, my friend, are still infected with religion. I have had so many atheists come to me after they read this book or seen one of my talks and say, I had no idea that I still had hang-ups. I had no idea why I felt this way about X, Y, or Z. A lifelong atheist, atheist since 14, came to me and said, I cannot do oral sex. And now I understand why. My Methodist mother, who let me stop going to church when I was 14, told me it was a sin. And I still can't get over that. That's religious infection. We act like Christians. We do it when we hide our sexuality. 
when we, we pretend we don't or didn't do something like have premarital sex to our kids or our grandchildren, when we let religionists condemn perfectly legal and normal sexual behavior without challenging them and act ashamed of our own sexuality, including things like <laughs> failing to admit we use porn. I use porn even as Jesus watches me. I think somebody said when Jesus is watching you, he may be getting off himself. Who knows? Some other wag said when you're married and Jesus is in the bedroom, it's a threesome. So, you, you know uh, Jeff Foxworthy of, uh, you might be a redneck fame. Well, let's look at it this way. You might be a Christian atheist. Think about that, a Christian atheist, if you feel guilty about masturbating. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel shame admitting you enjoy porn. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your children about sex or sexuality. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your spouse or partner about sexual fantasies you would like to try. You might be a Christian atheist if you feel disgust around normal sexual activities. Now this is confession time here, folks. <laughs> confession, right? And tonight at the, uh, at the um, costume party, you will know what I mean. Much more than I'm letting, I'm not gonna tell you the secret. Tonight you will. Uh, of course, with discretion, I don't, I'm not asking straight questions, uh, direct information, but how many of you does one of that apply to? Okay, about 40 to 50% of the people in this room raise their hands. Now, the people who did not raise their hands are in relationships with people who have those problems as well, if not more so. So this applies and affects all of us. Religion's weak spot is sex and sexuality, like I said earlier. You can't take sex out of religion or you will, it will collapse. So, don't let religionists dictate what we talk about. We can talk openly about our sexuality. Follow the lead of the gay community. I think the LGBT community is more open, more upfront about their sexuality, and I absolutely love it. They don't, yes. Your sexuality is a direct challenge to religiosity. Go debate whether God exists all day long, but come out as an open polyamorous person and watch what happens. That is a very direct challenge, very direct challenge to religion. Come out as an open homosexual and watch what happens. I mean, that's, what's, that's what sexuality does, is it challenges religion at its root. You can't get any deeper than human sexuality. Without it, religion can't survive. So my, my suggestion here to you today is to be out about your sexuality and respect and support other people in their chosen sexuality. It's the biggest challenge you can do to religion. I suggest it's the biggest we can do among many other choices we could do. Examples for You could say, well, sure, I fornicate just like religious people do. <laughs> or, sure, I masturbate. Don't you? <laughs> sure, I enjoy pornography. I don't see anything wrong with it. Just like most religious people do. And then just throw out a little tidbit here or there. The highest porn use in the United States is in uh, Utah and Mississippi. What's that all about? <laughs> Change the frame. Frame their behavior. Control of women's bodies and sexuality is one key to successful religious infection. And we've seen that all throughout this convention already. How much people have talked about uh, uh, inhibiting birth control for women and shaming women and abortion and all that sort of stuff. We need to challenge this in ways that frame their behavior. Here's a way to frame it. A secular woman might say, uh, sure, I take birth control because I like sex in or outside of marriage, just like Newt Gingrich and Rachel Limbaugh. <laughs> you 
Now this is an in-your-face challenge, and what are they going to say to you? You're wrong, you're immoral? Well, if you're wrong and you're immoral, then their heroes have to be wrong and immoral too. I want us to challenge ourselves. I want you to look inside yourself, and I want you to think about how can I be more in tune and more honest about my sexuality in, with those I love and those who are around me. And I'll come back to why that's so important a little bit later, but I want to give you some examples. And one example just happened last week. Our dear friend, Edwin Kagan. If you read his blog, now you need to be tactful and be aware of the consequences. I'm not saying come out in places that will get you in trouble or get you fired or whatever. But I am saying let's do what we can and examine yourself. Edwin Caden came out last week in his blog and said, I was a nudist for many years. And I think that's great, I think that's honest, that's open. If you're a nudist, don't hide it. There's no reason, there's no shame in being a nudist. Now when I was, when I was raised, my mom and dad was always, always snickering about, we think there are nudists in the, in the neighborhood, you know, that sort of stuff. So I get this shame message from them. If you're kinky, be not ashamed. If you're anything sexual, be as open as reasonably possible re with religious people. It's a direct challenge to their guilt-based lifestyle. If you're polyamorous, if possible, don't hide it. In casual conversations, you can say things like, Sure, I talked to my children about masturbation and birth control. I told them how normal it is and not to listen to other children when they say their religion says it's wrong. A direct challenge. Now, you have, a, you have as much right to teach your children about sexuality as those stupid abstinence-only religionists do. And you have as much right to put it in their face as they put it in your face. In a conversation, you might say, my husband and I have been open in an open rush for 20 years. We enjoy it a lot. What's your problem? You and your husband haven't had sex in how many decades now? I am not a Christian. I am not bound by the Christian rules of sex and sexuality. I don't have to pretend that I follow their rules. I'm quiet. I, I'm quiet. I will quietly challenge their guilt-based religion by simply being who I am and talking about what I do. Within reason and within intact, and I'll give them the gory details, but I'm polyamorous. I'm not ashamed of it at all. And I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about it. I am not going to hide it. I don't hide it from my neighbors. I don't. So those are, those are some examples. But here's a couple more. And these are courageous people. I am in awe of the courage of Maryam Namazi and her calendar initiative. And two of my friends, two of my friends, who are right here in this room, volunteered to step up and challenge patriarchy and all around the world, but it's just as much needed to be challenged here with the calendar. How many of you are familiar with the calendar, Namazi? Okay, some of you aren't. Okay, go buy it, get online, let people know about it, advertise it. Uh, so anyway, moving right along. The sexual challenge. If, women, if someone is racist in front of me, I will challenge them. If someone is sexist, I will call them on it. If someone is sex negative, I'll call them on that too. That's just as important. Let people know you are a sex positive person and you will stand up for that value system, that view of sexuality. Let go, let go of the shame about your own body. It's the only one you got, you're not getting another one in this life. So get used to it, enjoy your own body. Let go of judgment of others' bodies and sexual preferences and kinks and desires. Let go of the guilt about your own desires and fantasies. Let's go on the offensive here. Let's ask some embarrassing questions. Does your priest or priest or imam masturbate? Did they have premarital sex? 
Are you honest with your children about your sex life or your sexual history? Do you expect your children to do what you couldn't? I mean, those are honest questions. Be honest with your children and your grandchildren. Tell your children if you had several lovers before you got married. Tell them you masturbated since you were 12 years old. Be and act comfortable. Somebody started earlier? Be and act comfortable with your sexuality. If you act ashamed of your sexuality, your children will get the message no matter what your words say. Challenge your shame, get the guilt out of your system. If you feel shame or guilt, it's generally related to religious training and ideas. Your shame or guilt helps perpetuate the culture of sexual oppression. Your sin, you are, you are participating in this culture of oppression because you're not getting rid of this religious guilt that you've imbibed. Your inability to be open and honest about your sexuality is a continuing sign of religious infection. A residual infection, if you will. So why did I write Sex and God to wrap it up here? To help you and those you love get over the residual effects of religious sex. To begin to build a framework for sexual, for secular sexuality. To celebrate positive, natural sexuality. And to encourage secularists to be open and proud of our sexuality, free of religious shame and guilt. We are unique. We are secular sexuals. <laughs> we, are, we are not tied to religious guilt and shame based on, you know, that of the Mormons, Christians, Muslims, Hindus. So let's not act like them. I am a sex positive atheist and I'm proud of it. I am a secular sexual. And I would like to suggest we start thinking in those terms, even using the term secular sexual, as opposed to a Catholic sexual, or a Baptist, or a Muslim sexual. Thank you. It's been a great talk. Go away.